Okay, the last part of the enzyme lecture, hopefully. So, concept 8.5, regulation of enzyme activity helps control metabolism. So basically, all of our cells have, have many enzymes, thousands of enzymes, and all of these enzymes usually operate at the same time and then, of course, within the same volume of the, of the cell itself. Um, these enzymes usually, like I said, most of them work together in teams in multi-enzyme complexes. So they have a, they usually generate a pretty complex web of metabolic pathways. And each of these metabolic pathways is composed of multiple chains of chemical reactions happening one right after the other, in which the product of, of one enzyme catalyzed reaction will be the substrate of another enzyme catalyzed reaction. And so with all of these different complex pathways and different reactions going on, uh, there has to be some sort of way to regulate it because otherwise it would get really kind of chemically confusing in the, in the sense that we refer to it as chemical chaos. So with that being said, we move on to how enzymes are regulated. And so regulation can occur on many different levels. Uh, one is that you can actually regulate the gene expression of the gene that encodes for the enzyme. So if we don't, if we no longer need an enzyme to function, we can actually just turn the gene off that encodes for that particular enzyme. The second way to regulate is to confine the enzymes into particular subcellular compartments that are enclosed by distinct membranes. So in other words, having the correct enzyme work in the correct organelle. So for example, pyruvate dehydrogenase, we would confine it to the mitochondria. The third thing is to modify the enzymes to control their function. Uh, the fourth way to regulate is to destruct enzymes or destroy them by targeted proteol proteolysis, which is in the name of where you're actually destroying the protein by using proteases and water. And then the fifth way, which is the most common, is a more direct reversible change in the activity of the enzyme that is in response to a specific molecule that it encounters. And that's what we're getting into now. So that particular molecule that it encounters could be considered an inhibitor. So we have this idea of feedback inhibition, which is a, a negative way of regulating enzymes. So a metabolic pathway in general can be stopped by the by, well, let me back up. An inhibitor, when you inhibit something, you stop it or you prevent it from happening. So feedback inhibition is stopping the metabolic pathway. Um, and we can do that by binding its end product to the enzyme that acts earlier on in the pathway. So for example, in this picture, uh, molecule A is the substrate for enzyme 1, and B is the product for enzyme 1. B is also the substrate for enzyme 2, and C is the product for enzyme 2. And then C is also the substrate for enzyme 3, and D is the product for enzyme 3. And in this case, um, the more that we produce the molecule D, we have an excess of the D molecule. So with an excess of the D molecule, the D molecule can actually act as an inhibitor to where it will bind to a part of enzyme 1, preventing enzyme 1 from, from completing its function, and then thereby shutting down the whole pathway. So we see this a lot in, in, in our metabolic pathways, and this particular picture was in your textbook, and it is the um, uh, synthesis of the isoleucine amino acid. I'm going to go ahead and skip that. That's what we already talked about. Same thing. So we have this idea of... Um, uh, competitive inhibitors and non-competitive inhibitors. So we know what an inhibitor is, and there's two different types, right? So a competitive inhibitor is a reversible inhibitor that actually resembles the normal substrate molecule. So therefore, it will bind to uh, the active site. It will compete for admission into the active site. And so therefore, if the competitive inhibitor binds to the active site, then it will actually block the substrate from entering the active site. And then therefore, uh, reducing the enzyme productivity. So one way to overcome a competitive inhibitor would be to increase the, sub, the, the concentration of the substrate. Therefore, you have more substrate molecules that are competing with the inhibitors, and therefore, uh, potentially more substrate molecules can bind to the active site rather than the competitive inhibitor. A second type of inhibitor is the non-competitive inhibitor. A non-competitive inhibitor um, does not directly compete with the substrates for the active site. Instead, the non-competitive in inhibitors will actually bind to another site on the protein that causes a conformational shape change 
but that conformational shape change will then um, render the active site less effective as well because typically that active site will, will ex experience a conformational shape change as well. So in other words, it still is impeding enzymatic activity. And then of course, here's a little fun, fun meme for you guys. Okay, so uh, we talked about feedback inhibition, and now we're going to move on to allosteric regulation, which can be either positive or negative regulation. So in allosteric regulation, it's where a protein's function, specifically an enzyme's function at one site, is affected by the binding of a regulatory molecule at a different site. So allosteric comes from the Greek word allos, meaning other, and stereos, meaning solid or 3D. So in other words, another site. Proteins in general have two different binding sites on the surface. One is an active site that binds to your substrate, and the other is a regulatory site that binds to the regulatory molecule. Both of these sites communicate in such a way that whatever happens at the active site, catalytically speaking, can actually be influenced by the binding of a regulatory molecule at a separate site on the protein surface. Most proteins that we have discovered today are considered allosteric. Now, Allosteric effects are important um, in, in the regulation of enzymatic reactions, which we know, and both uh, allosteric activators can enhance activity and allosteric inhibitors can reduce activity, but both of them help control the enzyme reactions. So this Oh, well, we already talked about that. Uh, this picture right here, allosteric activators and inhibitors. So again, an activator can um, activate an enzyme, an inhibitor can inhibit the enzyme. And then cooperativity, we will actually uh, come back to. So allosteric effects and cooperativity. Here we go. So allosteric effects occur when, uh, again, this is kind of a review, when the binding properties of the enzyme change as a consequence of a second ligand binding to the enzyme and then altering its affinity towards the first, or in other words, the substrate. Um, the thing with allosteric regulation is that there doesn't need to be a direct connection between the two ligands that we're talking about. So in other words, it brings back the idea of the active site and the regulatory site. There's two separate sites and they don't have to be connected to each other. Um, they can be on completely opposite sides of the protein or they can even be on different subunits of the protein. If the two ligands that we are talking about are the same, so in other words, if they're both oxygen, then this is called the homotropic allosteric effect. If the two ligands are different, so for example, oxygen and BPG, then this is called a heterotropic allosteric effect. With enzymes that have multiple ligand binding sites, so for example, hemoglobin, because hemoglobin is um, a uh, multiple subunit protein, the allosteric effects can actually generate what's called cooperative behavior. And this is where cooperativity comes into play. So cooperativity, it's a form of allosteric regulation that can actually amplify the enzyme activity. And this is where uh, one substrate molecule, for example, when it first binds, it can actually what we call prime the enzyme to act on the additional substrate molecules more readily. So it's allosteric because the binding of one substrate to one active site will actually affect uh, the catalysis of different substrates in different active sites. Okay, so in other words, they're all working together. Now, um, even though hemoglobin is uh, not an enzyme, it does act as a good example for positive cooperativity. So it's the example that I'm going to use to illustrate um, cooperativity. So in other words, okay, so hemoglobin we know is the protein that will bind to oxygen via the heme, or actually the iron molecule within the heme. It will bind to the oxygen, and then it will transport that oxygen from the lungs to the other tissues within your body, right? So hemoglobin is an example of positive cooperativity um, because the once the first oxygen molecule is bound to the hemoglobin subunit, then the adjacent subunit's affinity for oxygen will increase. Okay, so that's what this says at the top. The adjacent subunit's affinity for oxygen increases after the first binding of an oxygen molecule. Um, technically, there's two forms of an enzyme, and I know we're going back and forth between enzyme and protein, but it, it 
the two forms of the enzyme also fit with the protein as well. So there's two forms of the protein. You have the T or the tense state, and you have the R or the relaxed state. And so in this picture of hemoglobin, this one right here would be our T form or our tense state. And then this one over here would be our R form or our relaxed state. So the T or the tense state is the one that will bind oxygen with very low affinity. Okay, we have strong hydrophobic bonds and we have our weak ionic and hydrogen bonds and so on and so forth. And we have a very low affinity for oxygen. But in the R or the relaxed state, it will actually bind oxygen with a very high affinity. Okay, and typically the T and the R states are in equilibrium with each other. So positive cooperativity is where the T state or the tense state of the protein actually, or the amount of the T state of the protein actually exceeds the R state. So in this case, the binding of oxygen actually increases the amount of the R state. So in other words, once one oxygen molecule binds, then the conformational shape change of the protein becomes more relaxed. So then in that relaxed state, it will actually increase the ease of other oxygen molecules binding to the other subunits. Okay, so that's an example of positive cooperativity, where one oxygen molecule binds a hemoglobin subunit, oxygen binding disrupts the inner dimer bonds, and then therefore the increase of oxygen affinity of the remaining subunits. So an example of negative cooperativity or in reverse would be, let's say the relaxed state exceeds the T state, well then the initial binding affinity is really high, but then once you have the binding of whatever ligand that we're talking about, um, binding to the R form, that will actually increase the tense or the T state. And then once the T state is increased, then it actually reduces the binding affinity. So it's just an example of cooperativity. And then here are uh, some common diagrams that you'll see. Um, so for example, this is just showing you that um, no cooperativity, uh, so it's essentially just showing you that um, the the Oh, I'm looking for the word. The flip-flop between the T state and the R state in this diagram, you know, and it's showing you that once the first oxygen molecule is bound, then it makes it the affinity for binding the other oxygen molecules is increased. And um, also the higher the oxygen, then the more cooperative the hemoglobin is. And so then therefore, the more that the oxygen can be transported throughout uh, the different parts of the body. Okay, and then those are just some practice problems. So again, that's the lecture for enzymes. Uh, so make sure you bring your questions to class and I'll see you guys then.